This is a tweet by the Austrian Embassy to the European Union. It reads, renewables means renewables. It's the tip of the iceberg about a nuclear cold war happening not in loud speeches, but over several critical pieces of EU legislation. Two opposing coalitions are facing off against one another, one led by France and Poland and the other by Germany and Spain. While there are ideological reasons for the war, protesters played nuclear hide and seek. Make no mistake, this is an economic competition that is determining the energy future of Europe. It's happening at a time when Europe is rewiring its entire energy system and supply chains, both as a result of its economic and energy war with Russia and its green transition. So what is going on with nuclear in Europe and who is winning? This video was sponsored by Brilliant and made possible thanks to Inter Europe's Patreon supporters. Okay, so let's return very quickly to 2020. The EU adopted the European Green Deal, the world's most ambitious plan to cut down on CO2 emissions, with for goal to bring them to net zero by 2050. And so for the past three years, the EU's member states have been debating on what that transition actually means. The EU's different countries need to define what is considered as being sustainable, for which there isn't a clear definition. This is a political debate in the case of energy, and it has led to the birth of two blocs who are fighting over whether or not nuclear fits that definition. First, there is Team Low Carbon, which wants renewables with nuclear and considers it as sustainable. It includes EU heavy hitters like Poland and France, alongside nearly all of the EU Central and Eastern European member states. Then there is Team Green, which wants to deploy renewables much more quickly while phasing out nuclear. But since they plan to use gas to compensate for the fluctuations of renewables, we could also technically call them Team Gas. Its core members are Spain and Germany, with the support of Austria and Denmark. This debate between the two teams reflects the reality that renewables on their own aren't enough to decarbonize the economy. Because they generate power intermittently, they need either backup in the form of storage technology that doesn't yet exist at scale, or nuclear and gas power plants. And while the starting point of this conflict is ideological, with different opinions on the danger and necessity of nuclear energy, and whether the priority is actually to eliminate CO2 emissions, this has morphed into an economic conflict. Despite the high initial investment, in the long run, nuclear energy is reliable and relatively cheap to run providing a degree of energy independence and a competitive power source for industry. And so for some countries to have nuclear energy while others don't would give those countries an edge in the form of cheap electricity. On the other hand, the countries going for gas as a backup see it as faster and more cost effective to scale, and a power source that could eventually be phased out as renewables and storage technology becomes more widely available. On top of these considerations comes national interest. On Team Low Carbon, for France, nuclear is a strategic industry. For Poland, which has limited options to import gas, it's about providing an alternative to coal and perhaps even in the long run, developing a nuclear weapons program. Whereas for Spain, with its plentiful sun, renewable electricity could become significant for exports, while in Germany, opposition is much more ideological in nature. So now that we've established our actors and why they're fighting, we can look into this economic war between Team Green and Team Low Carbon. It's a story in five acts. The first, as any story on nuclear energy, is the post-Chernobyl era. After the 1986 nuclear disaster, nuclear industry around the world got a bad rap and started to falter, since that several European countries, including Italy and Switzerland, had banned or were planning a phase out of their nuclear programs. At the same time, after Chernobyl, there were the first moves to reduce global CO2 emissions with the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, and a decade later, the EU's 2009 Renewable Energy Directive, which stated that European countries should have 22% of their energy from renewable sources by 2020. This first act was technically a win for Team Green, since it excluded nuclear and thus indirectly pushed for the gas-renewable mix. It's a move that would prove to be an important blow to Team Low Carbon's leader, France. Despite having one of Europe's cleanest energy mixes, it was fine for failing to reach that very same target. This would set the stage for the conflict between Team Green and Team Low Carbon, between nuclear and renewables and gas, roughly a decade later, when the European Green Deal came along. Strong opposition by Team Green looked as if Europe's nuclear industry was facing a shutdown, especially considering that most of Europe, including France, had grown relatively nuclear skeptic following the Fukushima nuclear disaster. 
Germany, the leader of Team Green, which decided to phase out nuclear following the Japanese disaster, massively expanded renewables while announcing the construction of new pipelines like the now defunct Nord Stream 1 and 2, as well as gas power plants. This shift saw Team Green prepare three killing blows to nuclear energy, which would have made it virtually useless. The first was through the exclusion of nuclear from green hydrogen production, limiting its usefulness for industry. The second blow would be its exclusion from the EU's green taxonomy, which would have limited investments in nuclear power plants. And the third is the raising of renewable energy requirements to a level that would limit the share of nuclear energy a country could have, preventing countries from going full nuclear like France. But this brings us to the third chapter, which has resulted in these killing blows being averted. And that boils down to mostly one thing, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Team Green's strategy of renewables backed by natural gas, much of which came from Russia, came crashing down as it scrambled to import LNG at sky-high prices. Countries around the world regained interest in nuclear energy as they looked to hedge against expensive commodity prices and looked to be more self-sufficient in terms of energy. This has proven to be a boon for Team Low Carbon. France, despite its own problems with its nuclear industry, managed to consolidate a coalition of pro-nuclear countries. When the EU announced to repower EU, its initiative to reduce its dependency on Russia, it included the deployment of both renewables and nuclear energy. And this new balance of power is finally making the room for compromise between Team Green and Team Low Carbon, and is why natural gas and nuclear are paired together in nearly every piece of legislation the EU is passing. Through behind-the-scenes haggling, we're seeing the emergence of a potential compromise. France is accepting the transit of Spanish hydrogen to Germany, or building electricity interconnectors between France and Spain, which would open the door for Spain to sell energy to the whole of Europe, in exchange for both Germany and Spain's acceptance of nuclear energy. But despite this compromise, Europe's two largest economies are doubling down on their two strategies. Germany has announced the building of additional LNG capacity, gone on tour around Africa to sign LNG deals, and announced the building of 20 gigawatts of gas power plants. Whereas France, despite its repeated nuclear issues, has announced the construction of up to 14 new nuclear reactors. And that means that the economic war over nuclear energy is continuing. And in March 2023, Team Low Carbon scored its first win with the inclusion of low carbon in a key piece of legislation, the third Renewable Energy Directive. That document did two main things. It raised the European Union's renewable energy target to 42.5% by 2030, and it defined what tools and technologies Europe could use to reach that goal. The deal that was found allows for nuclear and industrial applications like hydrogen and transport, but nuclear won't count into the global renewable energy target, meaning that nuclear countries like France still have to massively deploy renewables. And while this is a small first victory for Team Low Carbon, the next battlegrounds are already being set around two future pieces of legislation. The first is the EU Clean Industry Plan, which, if it includes nuclear, would make the production of nuclear reactors a strategic industry for which the EU would need to build capacity. And the second is the energy market reform, which would create a price for, for nuclear energy, effectively subsidizing it. But while this conflict makes the front pages, it shouldn't mask the last chapter of this story. And that is the fact that Europe is walking on an energy tightrope. The EU's two most extreme strategies embodied by both France and Germany both present deep flaws that it needs to balance out. Let's start by talking about Team Green, which would see Europe continue its dependence on a highly demanded and increasingly expensive resource, natural gas. And while countries like Germany insist it would replace gas with green hydrogen in the future, experts are skeptical about the economic feasibility, calling it wishful thinking that would imply decades of continued CO2 emissions and a continued energy dependence that Europe promised itself it would avoid in the future. On the other hand, Team Low Carbon strategy will take 10 to 15 years to materialize. It's also an industry that's susceptible to cost overruns and currently has a nasty dependency on Russia, which built or is building several reactors in Eastern Europe and is currently an important supplier of nuclear fuel, though European countries are setting up alternatives. The middle ground currently seems like the best strategy, by combining the two approaches, building nuclear reactors, LNG terminals, gas plants, and renewables all at the same time, hedging against high energy prices, supply shortages, and being more rapid to scale. After decades of sleepwalking without an energy policy, Europe, whichever road it takes, looks to pay a high price as it rebuilds its energy system. But what do you think? Who will win, Team Green or Team Low Carbon? What will the EU's energy future look like? If you want to understand the concepts behind Europe's great challenges, then you should check out the courses on Brilliant.org, because the world has never needed more educated, smart people to make and vote for the right policies. And Brilliant not only allows you to brush up on your basics, starting with arithmetic, 
You can make your way all the way up to university level knowledge in topics like physics and maths and the numbers behind neural networks. Thanks to their thousands of incredible courses, you can build up your fundamentals to understand chemistry, the conservation of energy, which are the basic principles on which any energy system is built. With their engaging and informative courses, you'll be able to learn about these new subjects in a way that's both fun and effective. And better still, the first 200 people to sign up using the link in the description will get 20% off Wilhelm's annual premium subscription. Thanks for your support. This was Into Europe. If you like this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe for the latest updates and analyses on European news. And if you haven't already, then I suggest you watch this video on the challenges facing France's nuclear industry or this one on the challenges facing Europe's economy in general.